Did you say off to the side here, this is infinity or infinity? Good. That's garbage work. You will do points off on the AP exam. That is unacceptable. Okay? It's like saying this equals love over democracy off to the side. This is nonsensical. They don't want to see it. Don't do it. Instead, go below and analyze each component and then decide if it's indeterminate or not. X squared goes to? Infinity. Natural log of x, as x gets infinitely large, goes to infinity. Infinity over infinity is an indeterminate form. Okay? And so because it is an indeterminate form, first of all, what the heck does that mean, indeterminate form? It means I'm not quite sure how this is going to come out until I investigate further. This gets big, this gets big, but it kind of depends on the rate at which they get big. That's the idea behind low tall. If I care about the rates, and I compare their derivatives. So I say this is can be found by virtue of <clears throat> comparing the derivatives, which is 2x over 1x. That then is 2x squared. Sometimes these have to go through twice, but this one doesn't. That definitely goes to infinity. What does that tell me then? Which grew faster, x squared or natural log of x? The top must have grown faster x squared. Okay, which we don't need. All right. Is that looking familiar? <clears throat> okay. Uh, this is the plan for the week, at least from what I can recall. Today's problem set tomorrow. Uh, we'll do an extra practice over recent material. And there will be a homework quiz in here somewhere. So you want to be sure you're doing a decent job of the homework. And by decent, I mean excellent. Uh, going over questions on mistakes, uh, not relying too much on people to help you. Uh, I, I am fine if you get help from somebody, but don't don't just go with, you know, just write this down. That's not going to happen. You need to understand what the heck you're doing, all right? Um, there will be a homework quiz, and on Thursday we're going to take a second part of that AP test. Um, I think I might do that in class. So you can expect Thursday to be no homework slash minimal homework and 82 on Friday. I guess I could switch those so you didn't have homework on the weekend. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, would you rather have the weekend homework and not homework on Thursday? Yeah, not homework on the weekend. Can we do it on Thursday? I don't know. It sounds like when people say no weekend homework. If, if I put it on the we on Friday, will you promise to go to Sadie's and get down with your bad self? Uh, <laughs> that means dance. That means dance. <laughs> that means dance. I don't know what you say. Oh, for? <laughs> That's what they said in the 70s. You said yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this, lesson, this lesson tends to go poorly and long if you don't help it participate. You will be lost. Uh, so I encourage you to ask questions. Now, first of all, <clears throat> rational functions are functions that look like this. They're basically ratios of uh, polynomials. Um, you do these a lot. They're a pre-calculus idea. There really isn't calculus to this lesson, which is why it's green. It's a pre-calculus lesson. <coughs> but we don't do this in the green book um, until now, I guess, for whatever reason. Okay? Also, it's reasonable to say rational functions. Who cares? Uh, the book doesn't do applications to these, but they have applications. And so I tried to put one on tonight's homework as to how you could see this in real life. Hopefully, you'll give it a good go. And not just say that looks hard, skip it. Okay? Here we go. Now then, um, we typically go through this process when we do a rational function. You first factor it, and then you look for holes. Hole happens if what? Yeah, it cancels if you have a common factor, 0 over 0. common factor. Um, so you need to be able to find the y value for that whole, basically take the limit as x goes to a or slash remove the whole. We'll talk about that in a minute next. 
You then say, all right, where is the numerator equals zero? If the numerator equals zero, then is it that zero or undefined? Zero. zero. And if y equals zero, then what's happening at the graph? Where are you? The x-axis. So where the numerator equals zero, you have an x axis Where the denominator equals zero, that's undefined. And assume, I assume that as you got closer and closer to that point, you're getting smaller and smaller numbers in the denominator, which means huge and huge numbers. That's what causes a vertical asymptote. Okay? Um, now, then, the new stuff of the day will be here. We know from all that what's happening around the origin. <clears throat> what's the vertical asymptote? What's the x intercept? The end behavior is going to be a little different here. You still take the limit. You can see each time you're taking the limit, but there are really three cases. If the limit is zero, this usually happens because there's more power in the denominator. The limit would approach zero because you have more power in the denominator causing the results to get smaller and smaller. Then you have what? Well, remember f equals 0, f equals y equals 0. There's a horizontal asymptote at 0, at the x-axis. Okay? If f goes to 0, then y goes to 0. If y goes to 0, you're approaching the x-axis. Done. What if the limit approaches some constant? Now, that happens if there are equal power in the numerator and the denominator. If f approaches c, then y approaches c. y approaches a constant. That means y is always the same level. That's a horizontal asymptote at y equals c. <clears throat> okay, That we've done a little bit. This part's going to be the newest part. If x if the function approaches positive or negative infinity, which usually happens because there's more power in the numerator, the graph might be something like this. If y goes to infinity or negative infinity, then rather than approach a horizontal asymptote, there will be a slant or oblique asymptote. Now those aren't different. Those are the same thing, just two different vocabulary words. Some folks call it an oblique asymptote, which is to say a line with slope, not a zero slope, or a slant asymptote. This will be the hardest part of today. That's what we'll focus on, but we'll warm up over here. <clears throat> All right. So uh, a lot of graphing of these. You know, again, on the homework, you'll have an application. I, let's change this to 5x, just so I don't have to change the scale. Let's not get too far. All right. Um, wouldn't you agree that this factors into x over x minus, or x times x minus 4 over x times 5 minus x? Yeah. All right, cool. There is a hole. What are the coordinates of the hole? The x being easy, the y being not so easy. What's the x of the hole? Zero. What's the y of the hole? Yeah, negative four fifths. So if you remove that factor, then it's negative four fifths. Uh, just in terms of total understanding, it would be super if you could tell me why is there a hole? Why, why does it happen? Just because some math person said, you know what? Put a hole there. Get, let's just do that. There are reasons for it. Okay. The point, okay, so first of all, there, the, the, why there's no point there is because 0 over 0 is a problem, right? Yeah. What about the rest? Say at 1 half, what happens to those guys? At 1 half, they do exist and they cancel, and so it's just that. At 1 tenth, what happens to those guys? They cancel, and it's just that. And at 1 hundredth, they cancel, and it's just that. So. At every point up to zero, these don't even exist. And it's really just about what does that graph look like. And then once I get there, I have to put a gap there. It's like the Bermuda Triangle. It doesn't even exist there. <clears throat> and so we have a hole at negative 4 fifths. 
What about x intercept? X intercept at four. Um, what about vertical asymptote? Five. Please, as you identify asymptotes, give me equations of asymptotes. And so x equal five or y equal five for the vertical asymptote? X, x equal five. I am picky about that. When you name an asymptote, please give me a full equation of that asymptote, not just the number. All right. <clears throat> Here we go then. What about end behavior? The limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus 4x over x minus x squared is negative 1. What does that imply about the end behavior? And the graph approaches. Horizontal asymptote at y equal negative 1. The infinite limit tells you the end behavior. The end behavior is y equals negative 1. So I'm like that. Okay. Now remember, remember that the this asymptote is for the end behavior, not middle behavior. Here's what I'm talking about. That guides the outside. I can cross over that asymptote in here. I don't care. That's for what happens as x goes to infinity. You can, it can be crossed inside. Don't sweat that. Don't freak out. It's fine. It's just a guide for what happens at the outside. All right? So, um, as a fallback, you can always do interval testing. From negative infinity up to zero, say, uh, I don't even care about this factor now. I have my hole, so I'm not going to even sweat this. At negative 10, what's negative 10 minus 4 sine wise? Negative, what's 5 minus negative 10? Positive overall, then y must be negative. That totally confirms following that asymptote until I get to the hole. Now, I actually don't even really need to sign test this region because the hole has been removed. I don't really even need to check this. This will be the same. You can verify it if you like, but it's not going to change signs until after 4. 4 to 5, maybe 4 and a half. What's 4 and a half minus 4? Sign ones. Positive. What's 5 minus 4 and a half? Positive. Overall, then, why is positive. So it stayed negative until it hit that x-intercept and then it stayed positive. That, by the way, makes sense to me. There will be a sign test or a sign change at 4 because this is first degree. As I go over that point at 4, it's going to change signs. Okay? Uh, likewise, as I go over 5, because it's first degree, I would expect to change signs. And I can verify that by taking 10. 10 minus 4 good buddy, is positive, and 5 minus 10 is negative. So, what does it do on the far right side? Can it be here, or here, or both? Let's go to my last question. Why can't it be both? That's ridiculous. Because that wouldn't be a function. That would be to say that when you put in 7, you get a couple different things. You don't get a couple you get one thing, okay? It says right there. It's a function. It should pass the vertical line test always. Okay, so that two regions is ridiculous. It must be one. And what the heck is going on? I think I just erased my whole presentation. Uh, uh, down or up? down. Okay? Uh, you could sign test and say it's negative. You could also say it doesn't have an x-intercept, so it just can't be up there. It's just no way. All right. So far, so good? Cool. Let's go on to a little harder one then. Um, this one. This does not really, I guess you could say it factors into, how's that top factor? If you're really good, I guess you can factor. 2 minus x squared has a factor. root 2 plus x, root 2 minus x over x if you're so inclined. Does it have any hole? 
No. Does it have any x-intercepts? Where? Post minus root 2, which is roughly 1.4. There they are. Does it have a vertical asymptote? Yes. That's zero. X equals zero, right? Okay, then. Uh, what about the end behavior? The limit as x goes to infinity of this function, I'll just call it y. What is it? Negative infinity, yes? Okay, it's negative x squared over x, that's negative infinity. That means then there is a slant asymptote. If it's going to go like that as we go right, then it's got to be following a slant asymptote. Um, to find the slant, you must divide. There are three division problems you might do. In this case, I could do long division. I could do synthetic division. But the easiest is if it's just x in the denominator, then it's just easiest to split up. I could rewrite this as y equals negative x squared over x and 2 over x to get negative x plus 2 over x. You tracking? Okay, then. Here's the conceptual part to this. y equals negative x plus 2 over x is equivalent to y equal negative x squared plus 2 over x. It is the same. All right, I, I, I can get a common denominator there, and I'm right back to where I start. So let's be clear, that's the same problem. This looks a little different. Cool? All right, here's what helps, though. As x goes to infinity, this remainder there will go to what? Zero. Two divided by huge will go to small. So as x goes to infinity, the remainder goes to zero. And so our graph will approach y equals what we get without that remainder. Our graph will get closer and closer to just straight up y equals negative x. This is the slant asymptote. If you are to graph y equals negative x, that's what the graph is going to behave like as x gets larger and larger. All right. Now, as far as where the graph goes, this is always an issue. How many regions do you see? Feels like four, yeah? I have people think, okay, so I have one, two, three, four. But in fact, there are two. There is on one side of the asymptote and the other. That's it, okay? There's not four regions because over here, it can't be here and here. It's got to be a function. I cannot graph here and here because when I put in an x, I get one y, not two. And that would be to say that they're going to fail the vertical line test. So that's a no. It cannot be in both. It's really not so much about how, where in the slant. Think of it more like where does it go with the horizontal asymptotes and the x-intercepts. <clears throat> so on the far left side, if it's going to follow the slant asymptote, it's probably going to have to be positive. Now, I could verify that with the sign test. Say I put in negative 10 uh, in either place. Negative, positive, negative. Two negatives is positive. Okay, you could also say negative 100 plus 2 is negative over negative 10. That's positive. Either way, you'll see it's positive. 
When you trip over root 2, negative root 2 then, though, at maybe negative 1, it's going to be positive, positive, negative. And so the graph will turn down. Now we get above the vertical asymptote, or above 0. x equals maybe 1. At x equal 1, what's the sign? Positive, positive, positive. Therefore, positive. So it's got to follow positive until it does what? Hits 0. And after that, maybe 10. Positive, negative, positive. That's one negative. That's negative. The graph looks a little something like that. OK. Um, is there anything else I wanted to talk about on that? I think that's probably pretty good. Um, that's good. OK. Now then, look at the next one here. You have y equals x squared plus 2 over x plus 1. Uh, let's go with factoring. Does it factor? Not over the real numbers. This would have to be imaginary numbers. So I'm going to leave it alone. Are there any holes? No. Are there any x-intercepts? What are the x-intercepts? If you were to solve the numerator or find the zeros of the numerator, there would have to be? Imaginary. Root 2i and negative root 2i, so there are no x-intercepts. There aren't always x-intercepts. It doesn't have to have x-intercepts. Are there vertical asymptotes, or is there a vertical asymptote? Yes. Yes, at x equals negative 1. Okay. What about end behavior? The limit as x goes to infinity. What is it? Infinity. That means that it's going to go, y is going to increase as x increases. So I'm going to get a slant. This, to find the slant, it's division case number 2. If it's a linear divisor, then synthetic can be used. Okay? Now, if I'm to divide x squared plus 2 over x plus 1, <clears throat> then synthetic is it's kind of like matrices. You just boil it down to the numbers within the problem and ignore the variables. So what goes in the box, 1 or negative 1? Negative 1. It's the 0 of the denominator. OK? What goes in the top row? Yeah, the coefficients of the dividend. Don't forget your placeholders, if necessary. It's 1x squared, 0x's, and 2. Okay? How does the old synthetic process begin? Take down the first number. Then what? Multiply and record it where? in the next column under the 0. So negative 1, you then add and do the same process. Multiply, record it in the next column. Here you go. Now, what this then says, <clears throat> or what you just found, is that if you are to divide x plus 1 into x squared plus 2, what you get is x Minus 1 plus 3 over x plus 1. Looks kind of funky. What if I got a common denominator there? What would happen? You go right back there. Okay, then these are exactly the same. Okay, they're, they look different, but they're exactly the same. You do this because they tell you different things. This tells you vertical asymptotes. It tells you x-intercepts. It's awesome in that respect. But this tells you what the slant asymptote is. As x goes to infinity, this 3 over x plus 1 goes to 0. And our graph approaches 
y equals x minus 1. That's the slant asymptote. The slant asymptote is the stuff in the front with as the remainder goes away. So if you were to graph y equals x minus 1, has a y-intercept of negative 1 and a slope of up 1 over 1. Looks like that. <clears throat> Remember, the slant is a guide for the outsides, but don't sweat too many regions. It's not four regions, it's two. Okay? On the far left region, you could do a sign test, or you could maybe figure out what the graph will look like without a sign test. Will it be option one or option two? It cannot be both. It must be a function. It can't be both. Which one? Yeah, it can't be this one because it doesn't have an x-intercept. So it, that's definitely not it. It must be the lower quasi-triangular region. Yeah. So it's down here. A sign test would yield negatives only and verify that. If I were to sign test on the right side, you know, at, for example, zero, what's y when x equals zero? Two, that's easy enough. And so that tells me it must be positive in that region. And so it's looking something like that. Please be careful also when you graph these. People that go too quick or careless do something like this. I count off for that. Okay, the whole idea of an asymptote is that you approach the asymptote. Is this approaching that asymptote? No, that's garbage. Okay, so make sure you approach the asymptote. Okay, well then, the worst possible case is this, <clears throat> because long division is required. You cannot use synthetic because you don't have a linear device. Let's start by factoring it. Um, maybe x times x plus 2, x minus 2 in the numerator, and x plus 3, x minus 1 in the denominator. Certainly, if you factor poorly, you're going to have a lot of trouble with these problems. What do you know about the graph? Tell me something you know about the graph. x intercepts at 0, 2, and negative 2. Tell me something else you know about the graph. You, Crips and Bloods, tell me. Vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes. At where? Negative 3 and 1. Good job, Crip. <laughs> All right. Uh, the slant. How do I know? Now, I don't need you to show me the end behavior limit, okay? I'm okay if you just look at it and say the limit as x goes to infinity is infinity, all right? Uh, you don't have to show that. This problem is already long enough without having to show all the little details. So I would like you, obviously, to be able to understand that it does have a slant asymptote. But I will be, I will know that you knew that by when you divide to find it. Synthetic division, uh, Mr. Bell and I disagree with this. He would have his students synthetically divide twice over, one by one and one by negative three. Um, I'm not a big fan of that uh, for a lot of reasons. First of all, because then you're dividing this big thing with the remainder by another. It's just, I don't, I just don't like it. Um, not to mention if there are not even real roots, then geez, we usually got to synthetically divide by imaginary roots. Not going to happen. So, um, x squared plus 2x minus 3 is going to divide into x cubed, no x squared, minus 4x plus 0. Has Mr. Baker gone off on his, you don't know how to want to divide anymore, Red? Yeah. Okay, it's coming. So now hopefully you will remember. Uh, it's going to take probably a whole day to remind you how to do long division. Um, if I recall. At least last year. So, here we go. Do you remember your long division algorithm? Okay, then. It goes x squared into x cubed. You look at the first into the first. How many times does x squared go into x cubed? x times. You write it there. And then you multiply x cubed, write it below, 2x squared 
minus 3x. Typically then in long division, you subtract that. So we will change signs of each and draw the line. You should gradually be working right in the problem. x cubed minus x cubed goes away. 0x squared minus 2x squared is negative 2x squared and negative 4x plus 3x is negative x. You then bring down the next term. <clears throat> then you start the process again. x squared into negative 2x squared. Negative 2 times. You don't need to show that off to the side. It's negative 2 times. Now, you'll see in a second that that's pretty much all you will need to do. That's the slant. Like was like first two minutes. Slant. Uh, I'm going to take it a little bit further just for the sake of notes, but on the homework, if you stop there, you'll be okay. Um, negative 2x squared minus 4x plus 6. Change signs. Draw the line. No x squareds. 3x minus 6. That's your remainder. 3x minus 6 divided by x squared plus 2x minus 3 is that. Now again, the concept of the day for slants is as x goes to, actually, let's go here. This is equivalent to the original problem. It just looks different. As x goes to infinity, the remainder goes to 0. So our graph will approach x minus 2. That's the slant. This the slant asymptote is y equals x minus 2. You can put it on the graph. Looks like that. Pretty cool. Okay, in the far left region, uh, and by left I mean less than negative three. What will go on at x is less than negative three? Above region or below? And give me what? Below because there's no x-intercept. You could also do a sign test to verify. There are going to be cases where the graph space isn't quite big enough, so you're, you're going to either choose to change the scale or you're going to really extend it off the space. I'm finding it away, I guess. Um, when we go over x equals negative 3, we'll probably get a different sign test result by virtue of this factor behaving differently. That means our sign test will probably result instead of negative as positive. So you can actually sign test this where you can say, well, they're all first degree, so there will be sign changes every time I pass over an x-intercept or a vertical asymptote. So when you pass over negative 2, this will change signs, and now instead of positive, we're negative until I get to that x-intercept. When I pass over 0, this factor will change signs, and overall results will be positive. That should not have failed the vertical line test, but you understand. And then once I pass over 1, here's where it gets a little funky because that asymptote passes through that point. But remember, this is only for the outsides. And so if this confuses you here, then just erase it a little bit and just use it once x starts to get large, all right? So uh, as we pass over 1, this factor will change signs. I was positive before, so now I'm thinking negative. So I'll be negative following that vertical asymptote. Until I pass through 2, where that changes signs, I'll have all five signs positive. Positive-wise, following the slant asymptote. You with me? Is that below or above? Good question. Uh, I can tell you it will be <coughs> above. Here's why. This actually, I wish I would have talked about it on a little cleaner example here. Uh, our function is this. Yeah. So this will go to a little higher level conceptual. Our function is this. Uh, x minus 2 plus this remainder stuff. You with me? Are you with me? Okay. Now then, 
for x is greater than 2, for x is greater than 2, how does this sign go? Positive. 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 So we could think about it this way. Our graph is like x minus 2 plus more. And so if our graph is like x minus 2 plus more, then shouldn't our y's be a little above the line? So to be true, as x gets larger, you should be above the line. As long as you follow it, or even put it right on top of it, you're fine. But it truly is a little above. And the gap between them would minimize as x got large. Okay? Um, this is a little overreach on my part. Uh, why, why do you reckon... I'm going to change this in a second, so don't start working here. But why is this going to be uh, funky? Think about it. Where, what's, what's the old... The, uh, there's a... That's first an issue. What's the overall power reduced to? X cubed over X. So that really is like X squared. This doesn't have a linear asymptote. This has a this has a parabolic asymptote. Um, now that's a little beyond the scope of what I need to do. Uh, I made the BC students do it, but I think that's it was not worth the time invested. So, would you change this to x minus 2 and try that one on your own? You don't? You change. Yeah. Are you sure? Yes. Uh, so, I changed my notes, but not. Oh. Oh, there you go. Cool. Perfect. You try that one. That's a great idea. <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes I change the, the notes. I said that did not go well. So forget that nonsense. The guy forget to change my presentation. Sorry. Say again. Uh, I I think at that point they're so kind of turned around that they're just saying whatever, just right. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Still early for that. <laughs> Let's give them some stuff. So can I see that? So, um, can I just hand back set 77? Yes. So I, I tend to do this sometimes. Uh, sometimes I grade it and then I hand it back before I've actually recorded it. 
Uh, so that's two options for me. I could either try and take them back, or I could just say, screw it, my mistake, I give everybody a 10. Uh, so I guess that's what I'm going to do in the interest of time. So if you are a lazy weasel who didn't even do 77, it's your lucky day, man, because you're getting full credit. <laughs> uh, if you lost points on 77, also it's your lucky day, you'll be getting a 10 on it. Hi. I will not do that again for another week or two. Like that. No, 78, 78 I definitely recorded accurately. It's there. Oh, no. You did not do it. <laughs> Missing. I was nearly done with it. Uh, yeah, see, you should do it. Turn it in. I'm missing 78 from four people, but I did record that one, so take that. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> keep pausing it. <laughs> keep trying. Keep trying. Keep trying. Keep trying. Zero x squared. Oh, this one's actually not too bad. So your slant, what's your slant coming out to be? X. X. Yeah, just y equals x. Sometimes that happens if things go beautifully. So y equals x is your slant. That's a happy day. Okay, just use it on the outsides. Don't worry about the insides. So I probably hope you're getting something like follows the y equals x line until it gets the x-intercept at negative 2. Then the graph turns up and is positive following the vertical asymptote at x equal negative 1. Then the graph goes negative following that vertical asymptote from the right until it passes through the origin and changes sign and follows x equal positive 1. And then the graph goes negative following negative 1 until it passes the x-intercept and follows the slant. You got it? How'd you do? Good stuff. All right, questions on 79. What questions do you have on 79? One. What? One? Is that true? One? Four? Not four? Oh, <laughs> that's a hoot for wiener. All right, so which ones? Four. Four legit? Okay. I know we no longer will take questions from Helmer. Four. 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 Eleven. Four. Eleven. By the way, I have your test graded. I decided on a, a curve. The 21 to 25 for each page will be an A. Um, 17 to 20 will be a B. 13 to... 16 will be a C. 9 to 12 will be a D. Okay. So, for example, if you had a 22, you would get a 92.5. Okay. Uh, four. Four is something like this. Y equals one half x is the boundary. One meter is the height. A trough six meters long it goes back this way six meters. They. I'm surprised you guys did this one. Um, which one were we expected to ask about? I thought people would ask about five, but usually people are confused by that. But maybe. Five, yes, okay. Five, like, you would see the Three, five, what? Four. Four. Three. Five, what? Oh. The whole. Uh, <laughs> um, it is filled. Make sure you read carefully. Weight density is a thousand. And this is work, not force. Make sure you read that carefully. Okay.
So work is the weight density times integral of. Uh, is that yeah. distance or depth in work do you care about? How deep a slice is or how far you have to move it? I'm not sure. I got the wrong answer. Okay. It's about how far you have to move it. So, for example, when I move this slice, I have to move it. If it's 1 here and this is y, then I have to move it 1 minus y meters. Each of these slices or sheets of fluid I have to move is of <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> forgot what I was doing. Um, each of these needs to be moved. Almost worse. Okay, there you go. Each of these has to be moved up and out. Yeah. Don't think triangle. Think volume of this little rectangular sheet of fluid. So think length, width, height. The width is varying. Each of these has different widths, x. The length is always 6, and the height is always dy. The limits are where the fluid is. In this case, it's filled, so it's 0 to 1. After that, then you need to just replace x with its y equivalent. x is equivalent to 2y. So if you integrate 1,000 times the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus y to y times 60 y. You'll be rolling. Don't forget joules are your units. Okay. Shall we get 5 while we're here? Yes. So you have this, uh, think of it like a container, and there's fluid pressure at the bottom. This is 1 by 1, and this is 5. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, where'd you put your origin? Here? Please open up your comfort comfort holding this to the company time between 40 and 80. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 This is force, not work. So it's about depth and area. Of all those slices. Yeah? Just on the door, not on the whole thing. So limits from where to where? One. How deep is each slice? For example, if I say here's the level of water and a half, isn't its depth five and a half? Because it's here's the top of the fluid. It's full. So the depth is six, not five. Or just what? Area of each of these slices is one wide and dy high. Are you stressing out about how to pay for college today during some hour? It's possible because it's a scholarship workshop. Yeah. We provide them with more databases to look at. Let us help you narrow that all with a slide for your scholarship all day. All seniors are encouraged to apply to a scholarship. Numerous scholarship opportunities are available to seniors, such as the National Council of Jewish Women and Sisters Global. We have students and many more. Stop by Hadley for further information. This has a typo in it. This is not. This is supposed to be as X goes to pi. That might have been the issue. Tickets are five dollars and must be purchased during lunch this Wednesday through Friday. So, I want to see what the limit is. X goes to pi. I'm going to take the limit of each part. Go 
And, and you know F is cosine. So what does it approach as X goes to pi? One. This we don't know, that's the question. And H is two plus cosine. What does it approach as X goes to pi? One, okay. Ours is between, our answer is between one and one, and it gets pinched. Basically, it's at pi, they're both coming together. Ours is somewhere in between, and so it's getting sandwiched or squeezed, and the limit must be pi. That is the sandwich or squeeze there. Okay. They both go to pi and ours is between, so it must go to pi. Other questions on 79? Did somebody say 9? Did you get an I did. <laughs> yeah, what did I say? Oh, huh. correct, more to me. You are correct again. The limit should be one, not pi, you silly goose. <laughs> All right, then. A delicious sandwich in the middle of A delicious sandwich. Sandwich theorem makes you hungry.